All right. Hello, and welcome to everyone joining us today for the second session of the 2020 Yale Chemistry Boot Camp. We're pretty excited to have you today with us uh, for this session. Uh, my name is Noreen Gentry, and I'm a fourth year graduate student in Jim Mayer's Inorganic Research Lab here at Yale, and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I have a few logistical comments to go over. So please feel encouraged to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout this webinar and to upvote different questions that have already been asked that you would also like answered. If you would like to address a specific individual, feel free to include their name in your question. And our team will work throughout the webinar to address your questions um, throughout the talks. And at the end of this webinar, there should also be time for some live Q&A. Um, so this three-part webinar series is designed to give you a sense of what a career in chemistry might look like and some of the considerations to make on your way there. In session one last week, we heard from some Yale professors and alums about potential careers and opportunities. Today, you're going to hear from four fantastic graduate students here at Yale about their path to science. And next week, we'll talk about the process of applying to graduate school. All of these sessions are being recorded and will be posted online for future reference. So in many discussions about graduate school and science, people will talk broadly about research but it can be daunting to grasp how research works, where you can start, and what you can expect in your experience. Research experience is required to enter STEM graduate school for several reasons. And we wanted to highlight that graduate school is very research intensive. So your research experience will not only help your graduate um, admissions committees evaluate you as a candidate, but it will also help you evaluate if you wanna spend the next four to six-ish years in a graduate program where you'll be doing a significant amount of research. Um, and before we go any further, I'd like to emphasize that everyone's path to science and research is a little bit different. So today you're going to hear from four different people and see four different examples of approaches that other people have taken. But these examples that we're going to share with you are not meant to be a recipe for what you need to exactly do, but we're hoping that they will be some inspiration for you to find a path that works for you and that you can find something that feeds your curiosity. Our speakers will tell us about different research opportunities that they found and took advantage of and how those steps influence their scientific development and tra trajectory. Our speakers will also tell us a little bit about their experiences getting their first research positions, the mentorship and guidance that they received throughout this process, the compensation that they received for their research, whether it was college credit or monetary. And then they'll also tell you what you might be able to expect or what things you need to consider as you try navigating this process yourself. And finally, engaging in research, engaging in research will hopefully help you develop more than just technical expertise. You'll have the opportunity to practice identifying and crafting different questions thinking critically about challenging topics and communicating your ideas and results to peers. You may even have the opportunity to connect with broader audiences through the literature, writing papers, or through attending conferences. Ideally throughout this process, you'll also develop connections with collaborators and mentors who may serve as references and guides for whatever future steps you may end up taking. And if you're thinking that you might want to pursue graduate school, I'd encourage you to tune in next week where we'll talk about tips about the application process and going through the selection process. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Jaylisa Torres Robles, who's a six year graduate student in the Benjamin Turk Lab. So go ahead, Jaylisa. You can, great. Sorry. Technical issues. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so hi everyone and welcome to our second session of the Bootcamp um, 2020 from Yale Chemistry. I am Jaylisa Torres Robles and I am a first generation student from Puerto Rico where I obtained my bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Puerto Rico and Calle campus. So my research path started there during my sophomore year um, after I took organic chemistry. I really enjoyed that class. And so I decided to ask my professor, then Dr. Elba Reyes, if I could work as a research assistant in her lab for credit. 
Um, so she ended up accepting and I, I was able to work there for six semesters on the extraction and characterization of, sorry, of um, chemical compounds from the plant agave. And doing that, I gained really basic organic chemistry research skills that I have been able to still use um, now as a graduate student. But I can say that um, the most important skill that I gained from this first research experience was probably um, the ability to think critically and read the scientific literature critically um, with the help of my mentor. That really helped me um, then and now to uh, develop my own ideas, hypothesis, and also design my own experimental plans. So an advantage of about how I started my specific path um, at my home institution, it, for me, was that I really gained a very supportive mentor um, that got to know me really well and helped me in guiding my path so that I could achieve my professional goals after college. Um, but my scientific path was also influenced by two other research experiences outside of my home institution while doing summer programs, uh, which are commonly called research experience for undergrads or REUs. And so my first REU was during the summer at the end of my sophomore year. Um, and for this, I actually took advantage of a resource that was available at my home institution, um, which is the RICE program. Um, this program is usually focused on providing students um, at my home institution with the opportunity to conduct research outside of the of the university. So they would bring recruiters from the United States um, to interview us for their REU programs. And so I decided to sign up for one of these interviews, specifically for the NSF REU program at Penn State University. And once I got accepted into the program, they kindly paid for all of my travel and housing expenses. And they also provided me with a stipend that would cover any other expenses um, during my two month stay there. So while I was at Penn State, I worked at the physics department um, under the guidance of Professor Mosset Moses Hung Wai Chen, um, doing electrochemical growth of superconducting ferromagnetic nanowires to study superconductive long range proximity effects in low dimensional systems like nanowires. And here's actually one of the nanowires that I was able to make that summer. And for me, this experience was actually very key in deciding then that I wanted to pursue higher education. Um, first, because it was kind of like a, an, an icebreaker for me, not only because I was exploring interesting new ways to apply chemical knowledge, but also because it was the first time that I got to experience science and do science in a language that was different from my mother language. So it really gave me that confidence that I needed to know that I could do grad school. And other than that, I also received really amazing support from all of the graduate students and postdoctoral fellows that I met there, um, but especially from my summer research mentor who was uh, really helpful and um, really helped me in becoming an independent young scientist. And later on gave me really good advice about applying to and choosing graduate programs. And so outside of the lab, we also had a lot of fun, um, both independently and through activities that were planned by the program. Um, with my program cohort, I was able to travel a lot uh, to places including the Niagara Falls, New York, we went to Hershey Park, we went to Philadelphia, and I was able also to go to my first scientific conference um, to present my summer uh, project, thanks to the sponsorship of my mentor um, from Penn State, who kindly paid for all of my traveling, lodging, and registration for the conference. So in fact, I had so much fun and during that summer at Penn State that I decided to do a second REU the following summer. And I did it uh, by applying online to the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship or SURF program here at Yale. So back then Yale was at the top of my list for graduate schools that I wanted to apply to. And the reason why I wanted to do a summer program there is, was because I wanted to uh, see the environment, learn about their scientific culture and meet more scientists from there, mostly to know if it was a good fit for me uh, to apply for graduate school. Cool. So I applied to the SERP program um, and I submitted the application through the Leadership Alliance website. And it was a normal application. 
Um, generally, they ask for a personal statement, three letters of recommendation, and a transcript. And then you submit your application. And once I got the offer, um, they also, the program also kindly paid for all of my travel and housing expenses and also provided a stipend for the time that I was going to spend there. When I was at, uh, at Yale for the summer, I worked at the Chemical and Environmental Engineering Department under the supervision of Dr. Eric Altman um, on doing a surface chemistry project while validating a machine that they had developed in the lab where you could simultaneously deposit and characterize thin layers of uh, material on a surface, um, mostly characterizing through low and high energy electron diffraction techniques, spectroscopy. So here is actually the electron diffraction of one of my samples that I did then. And to me, this project was really fun uh, and I found it really interesting, but it was a little bit challenging, especially at the beginning because it was a little bit outside of uh, the little knowledge that I had back then. So um, it felt very challenging, but it was still a very incredible experience because I also received a lot of support from my mentors and the postdoctoral fellow that was um, looking over my work then, um, where they actually helped me to understand everything really well. And I felt like I, I could ask all the questions that I needed to understand my project. And outside of the lab, I also got a lot of um, support from my program cohort who would organize study groups at night to, so that everyone could learn more about their summer projects. And it was really amazing. But one thing that I really like about um, the SURF program, other than all the fun that I had doing karaoke and visiting places um, in New Haven and also going to New York, is that the program actually gave us the opportunity to do a GRE pra practice test and an NSF fellowship practice where we actually got to write an entire NSF proposal based on the summer project that we were working on and got really, really amazing advice and feedback from our research mentors and also from graduate students here at Yale. Um, and so it was a really key experience that helped me later on getting this fellowship when I was a, um, a first year graduate student. And finally, we also got the chance to uh, present our work during the summer um, in an oral presentation at the Leadership Alliance Symposium, which was also an additional thing, thing that added to the professional skills that we developed during the program. So now, uh, uh, back then, because um, of the, the type of research that I was doing, the, that experience to me was really key in defining um, what kinds of research questions I wanted to uh, answer while in graduate school. And the, fur, the two experiences that I did during the summer really helped me in deciding that I wanted to pursue more organic and biological um, research questions going um, further. So I applied to the chemistry, graduate chemistry program here at Yale and got accepted. And I am currently um, a part of the chemical biology subdivision here. And I work uh, studying the specificity mediated by transient interactions and kinase signaling uh, networks where I am able to use many techniques from chemical biology, biochemistry, molecular and structural biology to answer uh, questions that will allow me to use chemistry to understand biological problems. And I am very passionate about that. So to conclude, um, having all of these research experience for me not only helped me to grow as a young scientist, but it also helped me to understand that I really liked research and that I wanted to do research going further after college. And it also helped me to decide what kind of research questions I wanted to answer. So it, uh, all of those experiences was really key in how I developed my path uh, through science. Um, and I just wanna reiterate that these are only three examples of how I got research experience before graduate school, but there are many other uh, research opportunities that you can explore, no matter the stage of your career that you're currently at. Uh, my advice is always that you, you should start early um, so that you can experience many different things. But if you haven't and you're almost graduating college, don't worry, you still have the chance. There are other opportunities like post back research experience and gap years in industry, which will hear um, later on that you can do to, to get research experience. Um, and remember, you can always take advantage of all of the resources provided by your institution or other institutions if your institution is not research um, focused. So yeah, just get yourself out there, be brave, and you're gonna have a blast with all of these opportunities. And thanks for coming. 
Great. Thanks so much for all your insights and for sharing your experiences with us. It's very valuable. If people have more questions, feel free to address Jaylisa in the chat. But up next, we're going to talk to Kevin Wernke, who is a fifth year graduate student in organic chemistry in Seth Herzon's lab. So I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Great. Great, thanks Noreen. Um, yeah, so my name's Kevin. I'm a fifth year in the Herzon lab. Um, uh, so back in 2012, I started college at CMU, uh, Colorado Mesa University. Um, that school is probably not one that many people have heard of, but it's, uh, while it's a university, there's no uh, graduate programs in the sciences. And so my exposure to research at my time there at CMU was uh, purely that of like an undergrad within an undergrad driven lab. Uh, so the PI was a little bit more hands-on. Um, the things we learned were from the professor. There weren't uh, grad students teaching us. Um, and so the research we were exposed to uh, was highly driven towards teaching. Whereas I would argue research at um, like an R1 institution like Yale is focused on publications and sort of cutting edge research and pushing fields forward. Um, during my undergraduate, I also had the opportunity to participate in an REU type program. Um, and so while NSF, National Science Foundation REUs are great, um, there are also privately funded uh, REUs as well. And so mine was sponsored by the pharmaceutical company Amgen, um, but Merck and other, other pharmaceutical companies also sponsor these. Um, so mine was at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, it was there I was uh, sort of first exposed to more cutting edge research, if you will. Um, and so in this lab, we synthesized small molecules, drug-like molecules, uh, to hopefully aid in the early detection of Alzheimer's disease. So a very pertinent problem, um, a problem that's affected a lot of our lives personally. Uh, and so it was really powerful to see synthetic chemistry uh, sort of on the front lines of bettering human health and disease. And it was sort of in that experience that I saw what research looked like uh, that pushed fields forward and made discoveries. And I also saw how chemistry could be uh, sort of used within that. Um, I went back and continued doing research uh, at CMU, obviously, until uh, I graduated. Um, the research there, I should mention, I guess, was uh, biological. So I grew E. coli and I played with amoebas and things like this. Uh, even though I majored in chemistry, I didn't actually do chemistry research until uh, the REU. And so then that brings us to my grad school experience, uh, which is actually in total synthesis. So I made a big jump from biological research primarily as an undergrad to um, chemical, uh, organic chemistry synthesis. Um, and so I guess one thing from my personal journey is, you know, just because you do one thing in undergraduate doesn't mean you have to stay on that path. Um, keep an open mind. Uh, there's lots of different flavors of research. Uh, it's kind of like ice cream. If you only eat vanilla, you're not gonna know what other flavors there are and um, what your favorite flavor might be. So definitely expand your horizons as you, as you can in your undergraduate. Um, and so I, you'll kind of notice that some of the themes are the same. I, even though I do chemistry now, it's uh, again, looking sort of at how these molecules we're making uh, affect human health in the context of the microbiome and how it might facilitate uh, colorectal disease, colorectal cancer. Um, how did I get these experiences? So by and large, the common denominator is relationships. Um, I was first asked to do research in my freshman year by a professor. Um, I was taking animal biology and she's like, you seem to like this. Have you ever thought about research? And I'm like, what's research? <laughs> um, and I wound up starting because I was pre-med at the time and uh, was told it would bolster my CV, but really fell in love with it. And uh, the rest is, as they say, history. Um, but I also talked to a lot of senior undergrads and you know, some were pre-med and I saw what they were doing, what they were preparing for. And I saw the senior undergrads that were doing research and kind of fell more in with that crowd and decided that their interests and my interests were more aligned. And um, from their experiences, I learned sort of what the next steps were, et cetera. Um, also, again, sort of uh, I entertained career paths I hadn't previously thought about. Um, 
you know, I thought I liked science and the way I can make money as a scientist is uh, going into medicine, but sort of through research as an undergrad, I realized that isn't the only uh, avenue for a scientifically minded person. Um, and then finally, the, like the REU that I got uh, was sort of a, a luck of the draw in a lot of ways. I applied to a lot of programs and only got accepted into one. And so if you do apply to some sort of uh, summer research program, not at your home university, then definitely fish with a broad net. Uh, apply to programs that you think you might be interested in, not necessarily ones you're comfortable with and are familiar with. And then finally, I, I decided on uh, continuing on with research mostly because I enjoyed it. Um, I remember the first summer I did research at my home institution and was paid a stipend over the summer. That was pretty sweet because most summer jobs, you don't learn that much. Uh, but getting paid to do science is pretty awesome. And that kind of stuck with me. And then the discoveries you make along the way, uh, I can't really describe what it's like to you know, run an experiment and find something that no one's really found out before or known before. And, uh, that's a that's a privilege and something sort of fun that you can't do in a lot of other fields. So I think with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks so much for your insights, Kevin. Going to go ahead and move forward to Savannah, who will tell us a little bit about her experience. She's a second year graduate student that is a joint student in two different labs, Patrick Holland Lab and also uh, Scott Miller. So she'll tell us a little bit about that experience. So Savannah, you can go ahead and turn on your video, perfect. Great. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about my path to research which, like many people, began during my undergraduate career, which I did at the University of Maryland. After a couple years of taking college courses, I discovered that I enjoyed both my organic and my inorganic chemistry classes the most. I was interested in finding a research group that might allow me the opportunity to learn a little bit about both areas. So after exploring the research group's websites online, reading some of the literature, and talking to a couple advisors, I ended up joining the research group of Mike Doyle. There, my research involved the use of metal carbene catalysis and diazochemistry as represented here. One of the biggest components of my education from my time in my undergraduate research was in the lab fundamentals. This was my first time in a lab, and so I learned a lot of the basics in lab skills, safety procedures, and analytical techniques. It also was my first exposure to data communication which I was able to get practice in both within the group and group meetings and reports, but also externally at a regional conference in addition to a couple publications. While you'll see over the next few minutes that I'm always still learning new things, I fully credit my undergraduate experience for giving me the foundation that I needed for the rest of my career. I also was lucky enough during this time to build a wonderful relationship with my advisor who was able to provide a lot of advice and mentorship uh, even beyond chemistry and still does to this day. Although I very much enjoyed my research at Maryland, I decided that I wanted to try something new and see what else is out there and available before pursuing graduate studies. After applying to a variety of opportunities in industry just online through the company websites, I ended up at the pharmaceutical company AbbVie, where I worked in drug metabolism research. Just very briefly, for those who might not be familiar, the basic idea of drug metabolism is that your body is trying to change the drug, usually by making it more polar, in order to get rid of it. You elucidate the structural changes to the drug by using high-resolution LCMS data. And in pharma, it's absolutely critical to identify the structures of these metabolites so that you can evaluate them both for potency and potential toxicity issues. So what you're looking at here is the metabolic pathway of the common drug ibuprofen. I share this with you only to show that although I was no longer doing synthetic chemistry as I had in my undergrad years, I think it's pretty easy to see how a background in organic chemistry was beneficial for this role. I had to be comfortable with the structures in order to identify the changes that occurred in the metabolites, but also I ended up working very closely with the medicinal chemists at AbbVie, 
in order to use my data and design better drug candidates. One of the biggest and coolest things that I learned during this time was in the area of new analytical techniques, such as the use of radioactivity and high resolution LCMS in order to elucidate metabolite structures. These are techniques that otherwise I might not have had exposure to in my synthetic chemistry time. Another really great outcome of my time in industry was the ability to network, not only within this massive company where I could reach across divisions and departments, but also externally at national and international conferences where I had the opportunity to share my research both in poster presentations and in oral talks. One of the most important things that I learned for myself during my time here was that it can be really beneficial to step outside your comfort zone. Admittedly, I knew nothing about drug metabolism before I started at my job at AbbVie, but because I was willing to take that risk for myself and learn this whole new field, they were willing to take the same risk for me, and it ended up being a really educational and wonderful time for me. Although I thought that was a, a really cool research and really cool things to be a part of pharma, uh, my original interests and passions in chemistry from my time in undergraduate still remained. And so I decided that the best way to return to chemistry would be to apply to graduate school. Amongst the many other things that I just discussed, my time in industry also taught me the importance of interdisciplinary science. I found that a cross-functional scientist that's trained across multiple disciplines has the power to break down communication barriers that sometimes exist in daily conversation. And so with all that in mind, I decided to become a joint student across both the organic and the inorganic divisions here at Yale. So now I'm a second year in the labs of Scott Miller and Pat Holland, where I'm studying the use of chiral peptide catalysts and hydrogen atom transfer chemistry. Like each of the experiences before this, I'm always learning new lab techniques. One of the absolute coolest things about being in two groups is that I'm around twice as many amazing and talented people, each of whom brings their own unique perspective from their own unique research path, and I'm lucky enough to get to learn from all of them. Also, while I mentioned that much of my previous communication experience and my time in industry was oral, in talks, and in poster presentations, I'm finding in grad school a lot more opportunities to practice my written communication and things such as papers, proposals, and grant writing. Being a second year, I'm looking forward to the next couple years and hopefully all the cool things that I'll continue to get to add to this blue box that I'm learning. And that brings us to now. One of the most important things that I want to mention, like Noreen said at the top, this is by no means a directional. These are the things that I've specifically learned for myself along the way, but the most important thing is that you can forge your own path. It's just important that you get started and get into research. No matter what you choose to do, even if you choose to change your mind along the way, you're always learning both in chemical and technical expertise, you're learning your hard and soft skills, and you're also learning about yourself and your interests and your own career aspirations. And like all of us, while my future is still to be determined, I know that I will take my personal lessons with me wherever I go. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I wish you all the best of luck with everything, and I'd be happy to answer any questions using the Q&A function below. Great. Thank you so much for your insight, Savannah. So feel free, again, keep asking questions using the Q&A function. If you have specific questions for individuals, you can continue to address them. But after Julian, we'll also have an open Q&A. So if you have more broad questions, feel free to um, ask those. All right, so next up, we have a third year graduate student in materials chemistry, Julian Brundler. So I'll turn it over to you, Julian. Uh, can you go ahead and unmute Julian? Uh, you had yeah um yeah thank you Noreen for the introduction um I'm Julian I'm a third year grad student in the Salton lab which is actually in biomedical engineering but I'm still getting my PhD in chemistry so something I wanted to mention briefly is um it's not really advertised but 
especially in materials chemistry, if you're interested in a lab that is not listed in the chemistry department, so for example, in chemical engineering, it's still possible to join a lab outside of the chemistry department as long as your uh, PhD has a sufficient chemistry background. Um, so what I wanted to focus on is um, yeah, no, it's working. Um, so I wanted to fo mostly focus on my path to science because I think my path is quite unique. Um, so as you might be able to hear, I'm actually from Germany, so I'm an international student. And so I went to high school in Germany and after high school, I actually took a gap year and I worked in finance. So I didn't have any background in chemistry. I had some interest in science, but uh, but not to an extent where I was 100% sure that I want to major in in science. And so during that gap year, I worked in finance and I played semi-professional soccer in Germany. And after a game, uh, a guy approached me and was like, yeah, are you interested in studying the US? I know this coach and he recruits uh, student athletes to play soccer. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And so they offered me um, a scholarship for this university or this college in um, in Florida called Ryan's College, which is actually a small liberal arts school, so no graduate school and pretty much only undergrads. And so my freshman year going in, I was uh, undeclared, so I didn't know what to major in. But after filling out a survey, so they, they actually put me in, in a general chemistry class my first semester. And so I took that class without any expectations and I actually kind of liked it. Um, I liked the, the challenge of those chemistry problems and I was also doing quite well. And then after, you know, during my first semester after one of my classes, a professor approached me and asked me, yeah, are you interested in doing research with in my lab? Um, that research was actually with gold nail particles. Um, I don't want to go into detail about the specific research, but I was like, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. Like I want to work with nanoparticles. So I ended up joining her lab, which turned out was only um, me and my research advisor and one fume hood. Um, which was actually good for me at that time because since I didn't have any background in chemistry, um, she was actually able, my advisor was actually able to teach me all the techniques that I need to know. So pretty much start from, from, from scratch and she was really hands on and showed me all the techniques. And this actually then ended up in my first real research experience where um, um, I applied to the summer research program at Rollins at my university, where we were able to work um, for six weeks and we got a stipend and we were able to work during the summer for six weeks in our advisor's lab and get a little bit of research experience. So it was a good start, but at that point I didn't feel like I'm, and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I continued doing that research during the semester, so my sophomore year and at that point, I also didn't know that you need research experience to get into a grad school. But so my advisor, who was really awesome, she told me, yeah, if you're interested in grad school, you should probably get more research exp experience so you actually have a chance to get admitted. And so I started looking at programs. And what I found out is, so since I'm an international student, I couldn't apply to most programs because they're NSF funded and NSF funding is only for US citizens. So I couldn't apply to pretty much all of the programs. There is a small number of programs that has private funding or university funding. So it's possible to still apply to those as an international student, but I couldn't apply to the most common NSF funded uh, programs. And she told me that she actually has a friend at MIT, a professor at MIT she knows, she went to grad school with, and she was thinking of going there the summer of my sophomore year to do her own research. And so I asked her, yeah, maybe it's possible that I can 
join you and also do some research there. And I was able to convince her to take me with her. And so I ended up doing summer research at MIT that summer. Um, since I didn't get any funding, um, I had to pretty much cover housing and everything myself, which I had some savings for my uh, gap year, but that's something I had to do. But that research experience really, really piqued my interest in grad, grad school because so I worked in um, Dr. Jeremiah Johnson's lab at MIT, who's a polymer chemist, and he has a pretty big lab with like 15 people. And coming from a lab where it was only me and my advisor to a lab that is doing cutting edge research was really, um, I'd also say mind blowing. Like you actually feel like you're doing something significant and you have all those interactions with postdocs and grad students. And most importantly, it also showed me how to, how a real, like a big research lab works and how to conduct research. And this really, um, took my interest for grad school and going then doing my senior year. So after that experience, and during my senior year, I started doing working on my senior thesis. And that connection was actually able to collaborate for my senior thesis with that lab at MIT. So I was able to do uh, cutting edge at, at research at my small undergrad institution by collaborating with that big lab at MIT and. So, um, next, next, yeah. And so what you actually see right here, the bottom right is some of the lab um, at MIT I worked in. And that's my unaffiliated advisor that went to MIT with me. And yeah, so I know my experience is really specific to my situation. But I think some general um, things or general advice I want to uh, give everyone and I wish I would have known at that point is I think most importantly, talk to your professors at your school and about joining their lab just to get like some taste for research. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you immediately say, yeah, I want to go to grad school, but I think you need like some like initial stepping stone, like you need some idea what research is like. And then I think what is really, really important is also get experience at other institutions and just to see like how other labs work. And you also get exposed to other ideas, other research, because they really, I felt like really narrow minded. All I did was I focused on gold nanoparticles, but I didn't know what else is out there. There's so many other things you can do with not only nanoparticles, but other types of chemistry. And so seeing that at MIT, that other type of research was really interesting. Um, so in order, I think in order to get the research experience, my advice would be first look at um, IEU programs. So like official programs at schools interested in, and especially the NSF actually has a list of um, NSF funded IEU programs. Um, which you directly can apply to. But so for my, in my case, I couldn't do that. So I think my other big advice is not only for getting research experience, but even later on, or I guess even when you apply to a company, just reach out to people, like reach out to advisors or labs interested in and directly email the professor and ask if you can spend a summer in their lab and do research. Maybe 50% of the time they won't respond. They can maybe try to, uh, write one follow up, but I think that's so. If you can't get an NSF funded um, um, IU program, you can still try to directly contact labs and professors and ask them if they have um, a spot for you during the summer. And also, doing that, you can also try to talk to your advisor and ask them if they know someone. So, if they maybe went to grad school with someone or if they know like a certain lab or professor, if they can connect, connect you to someone and if, maybe if they can kind of support your email and help you to get into, into a lab to get research experience. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Um, 
happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Julian. Now, um, we are to the live Q&A um, portion of this webinar. So I invite all the panelists to turn your cameras and mics back on. And we have a few questions that we've flagged already, but continue, please feel free to continue asking questions in the Q&A function and we'll continue to try to get through as many as we can. Um, so the first question that we wanted to try to tackle is a question surrounding imposter syndrome. So I know in STEM, especially as you get up to undergrad and graduate programs, imposter syndrome is pretty common. Um, so I guess my question to the panelists is, have you experienced imposter syndrome? How have you dealt with that? And um, yeah, I guess just take it away with what your experience has been and how you've been able to manage that. Um, if I can start if anyone. Okay. So yeah, um, I think I answered a little bit of the question on the Q&A. Uh, imposter syndrome is actually very common, uh, especially for graduate students um, and also especially for people from underrepresented backgrounds and first generation students. Uh, I think that one important thing that one needs to keep in mind is that same thing that is very common um, and that you're not alone. There are many people surrounding you that are going to be able to help you through it and to help you when you have doubts about your research or doubts about some specific method or doubts about yourself. Um, so don't be afraid to speak up um, about what you're experiencing. Something that has really helped me along the way with my imposter syndrome is basically looking for mentors that um, understand where I come from and mentors whom, with whom I could talk to about it. Um, and these are usually mentors that really support me and support my path and has helped me uh, guide my pathway throughout science. So I would suggest find yourself some mentors that really support your pathway and your goals um, and also um, speak up uh, to your peers, um, your graduate school peers or college peers um, about it. And you'll see that first you're not alone and, and you can get through it. Um, definitely don't let imposter syndrome stop you from getting all of these experiences because I know it's a little bit scary before you apply or even once you have been accepted before you go. But I assure you that once you're there, the experience is always going to be amazing and you're gonna learn a lot of really new interesting things and people. So go for it. And, and I'll just uh, echo what she shared, but also mention that mentors can be in your advisors or bosses, but they can also be fellow students. You can also find a lot of good mentor relationships um, within your fellow students or colleagues as well. Yeah. I'm I mean, um, I think what helped me was just to realize that other people probably feel the same way. And so like personally, I sometimes feel like, yeah, I don't know anything. And especially when I start reading about a new topic, I think it's common that it's impossible to know everything. I think you, you can be quite familiar with like a certain topic, but outside of that, um, it's impossible to know everything. Like just, just expect that other people might also feel the same way. So it's, it's pretty common. So in thinking then, um, another follow-up question, I guess, to this, a lot of times it can feel like there's so much that you don't know and like you're not prepared necessarily for a certain field. Um, how do people approach entering into a new field or taking your undergraduate experiences and applying that to graduate school? entering into a new area. Um, if I could go here. Uh, I honestly sort of embraced it. Uh, if you sort of uh, take your weakness and embrace it, I think it's a little bit easier to um, overcome. And so when I was changing from biology to chemistry, I was very upfront. It's like, I don't know how to run a column. You know, I can grow amoebas but I can't run a column, how do I do this? And so I think just embracing that you don't know and really leaning into that one helps you learn, but also 
you're not like there's no you're not trying to prove anything right you're just there to learn so um i can also add to this so as you saw i did research in very different topics um along my path and i think that one thing that i that i got from all of those experiences is that I, I really learned the basics of how to conduct research. And that is some, that's a skill that you're going to, you know, it's very transferable. You're gonna be able to use that in any research topic that you do, no matter uh, if you're switching areas, you're always gonna be able to get a paper, read it, understand, understand what they're saying, um, think critically about it and develop some ideas about the question that you're trying to answer, um, despite the topic. So what's that that's really what you need to like learn from these experiences. That's great. Uh, we have another question about uh, so many people sometimes will go from a bachelor's degree right into a PhD degree. Um, does anyone want to talk about in chemistry specifically uh, why people don't do a master's degree in between and if you encourage people to go straight into your PhD or if they should be thinking about doing other things in the meantime, based on either your experiences or what you wish you would have done? Uh, I, can, I can take that one. Um, uh, so, sin, so since in the US, so that's quite, I'm coming obviously from Europe, so the PhD programs in Europe are different. You get your master's degree first and then you get your PhD. So it's like several programs. But here, since you're getting your master's degree after, so when you're admitted to grad school, you get, you're getting your master's degree after usually two years and then you get your PhD afterwards. So um, personally, I don't think it's necessary to spend, uh, to get your master's degree somewhere else first and then apply to a PhD program. I think you can just directly apply for a PhD program since you're already getting your master's degree. Um, unless you're really interested in exploring other areas of science or of research. So I think one asked the question, um, if you can get research experience after your bachelor's degree before starting your PhD. Um, it's definitely possible. I'm not, I don't think it's quite as common in chemistry, but for example, in my lab, um, we had two or three postgrad students that finished their bachelor's degree and now worked in our lab for two years before they applied to um, medical school. So it's definitely possible to just do research in a lab after your bachelor's degree and just explore other areas. So it's definitely possible. And I don't think those positions are advertised, <clears throat> but as I said, you can just directly email labs and ask professors if they, they're looking for <clears throat> postgrad. Does anybody else have any thoughts on um, either taking gap time, what people should do during that period, or um, just generally uh, what to do between your bachelor's and PhD? Or if you preferred that you just went right through. Yeah, I, I'll jump in. So um, I know that it's often called a gap, a gap year. And for me, it ended up being a gap six years. <laughs> um, but I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. It certainly doesn't need to be an industry, although that's an option. Um, there are also post backs available that you can look into, which are sometimes just a one year or maybe two year program um, between your bachelor's and grad school. And so there are a lot of different ways that you can go about doing that. Great. And it seems like there's been a, a wealth of different experiences throughout the approaches that you've taken um, and the different um, opportunities that you've taken advantage of. Do people have a sense or a feeling of is the diversity of your research experience more important than the quantity of how much research you've actually done? Is it better to diversify or to really dig in deep to one specific area? Um, I think it, 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 
it can vary from person to person. It really depends. Um, to me, I felt like I wanted to explore more, more research topics because I, um, even though I, I loved organic chemistry and I still love it, at that time, I was like, not sure if I wanted to do that forever. So I wanted to explore other topics. So I feel like if you're unsure, it's fine if you explore different topics and, and, and that will help you decide what you want to do. But if you're like very set into what you want and what you like, it's fine um, to go in and do the same topic for all of your research experience. That's fine as well. Do you have any, I guess a follow-up question to this is, do you have any suggestions on how you can tie together various different research experiences to put together either a good package for graduate school or even just in how you can use those experiences together? Yeah, um, yeah, and that actually becomes really important once you're in grad school and you're trying to apply to fellowships and grants uh, as a grad student, because you really have to find a, a, a smart way to connect everything into one thing. And I think a strategy that usually works for me is basically thinking about what I did in each experience and getting anything that I learned, any skill, either professional or research skill that I learned from each experience that I am currently applying. And I always mention that, for example, in my personal research statement, um, like for example, my, my work here at Yale in the summer was very engineering. Um, and I don't know any engineering now, but um, the way that I was able to think about that project has really helped me now in the way that I develop my experiments for biological um, experiments. So, so that's something that I really um, think about and, and put it into, into words when, I, when I'm applying to grants, fellowship, or graduate school. So anything valuable that you learn from any experience uh, will add to your potential um, value as a graduate student. So don't leave anything behind. Yeah, and sometimes things end up connecting in ways in which you wouldn't expect it. If you find something that you're interested in, uh, take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. And sometimes those end up getting pieced together in ways that you wouldn't expect. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask and bring into the discussion is uh, the idea is uh, research and financial aid. Um, so does anyone want to talk about generally compensation for research, uh, how difficult it is to get either money or class credit, what different things people should be searching for when they're looking for these research opportunities? I can answer. I, I think some of these things might depend on the PI of the group that you're interested in. Um, for me personally, when I started my undergraduate experience, I was given the option of taking it for credit or for financial uh, reimbursement. I chose to take it for credit during the semesters and for financial compensation during the summers that I worked there. Um, but from my fellow students, it sounded like some of that can vary by group, but certainly everybody had one or the other, either credit or, or in financial compensation. And I will also mention that uh, graduate school is free. Um, so all of us as graduate students here at Yale, we all, um, our tuition is waived and we also get a living stipend. So um, once, you, once you get into a graduate program, a PhD program, then you don't have to worry about financial aid anymore, which is a nice thing to note. Does anybody else have any other comments on um, getting compensated? Yeah, I mean, something that I found out, so, um, so in Europe, you actually have to pay for your master's degree so when I found out that when you go to graduate school in the US, you actually get paid the whole five or six years to get a master's degree and PhD. There was also one factor uh, to decide to apply to US um, graduate schools. Because you actually get you actually get paid for doing research. Did you mention I, I wanted to mention that you also get paid for your summer programs? 
like the entire thing. Um, and not all of the programs, but some programs will also be able to pay for you to go to a conference and present your work. So that's also a nice addition. Yeah, that was definitely something that I didn't realize during my first research experiences is how much uh, money there is to fund either conferences or research and different things in general. Julian, you also mentioned that uh, the difference between the European system versus the US system. Did you want to comment a little bit more on some of the differences that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I never went to university in, in Europe, so I can tell you specifics, but from what I've heard from other people is, so in Europe, you go into a bachelor's program, you directly already apply to a certain division. So you already apply for a bachelor's program in chemistry, for example, and you can switch that. So you're getting a um, bachelor's in chemistry, for example, and then you would apply to a master's program anywhere in Europe, for example, and you have to pay for that again. I mean, university is cheaper in Europe, but you. You, you're not getting comp you're not getting compensated for a master's program in Europe, and then you would apply to a PhD program in Europe, and then you get small compensation, but I think nothing compared to here. So it's just enough to survive in Europe, but here, uh, I think the compensation is pretty pretty decent. Yeah, and I think a key distinction that you made also is. Um, the fact that in Europe, a lot of the programs you need to get a master's to then get admitted into a PhD program. Whereas in the United States, a lot of times uh, you go straight from bachelor's into a joint master's PhD program, like you go all the way through. Yep. So to begin a PhD program here, you don't need a master's before you start. Is I think something that I didn't realize at the front end of this. Um, I'd like to finish up with one last question of what's something that I'm going to ask that everyone answers. What's something that you wished you knew before you started research? And throughout this process, is there anything that as you look back that um, surprised you throughout the process? So let's start with Julian and we can work our way through. Yeah, I mean, um, since I didn't have the background in science, like I also like my freshman year or sophomore year wasn't, I didn't know about grad school in chemistry. So I would have liked to like know more about like the future path or like the opportunities, opportunities that, that are out there. Like I didn't know about um, IUs. I didn't know that you get compensated. I didn't know that you need research experience. I thought if I just get A's, I will get into any program. And so yeah, just more, I know, information. Was there anything specific that helped you get that information? Any resources um, or just? Yeah, mostly, so mostly my advisor. So my advisor was really hands-on and we met several times a week. And she pretty much guided me towards, towards grad, grad school and like um, making those decisions. That's great. I can jump in. I'd like to sort of echo what Julian said. I also felt that uh, I didn't know much when I started about what options are available, um, it, especially for organic chemistry. I think sometimes, at least for me, it felt like pharma is the option going forward if you're interested in industry. And um, the way I found out what's available was to just put myself in industry. And although it was within pharma, it was actually during that time that um, I learned about other fields and other options that are available for organic chemistry. Because going to conferences, you meet people that are maybe not just from pharma. And, uh, but I do wish that I had known that when I started. That's great. We'll go to Kevin next and then end with Jay Lisa. I was hoping I could go last. I was still thinking about it. Oh. <laughs> um, I guess one thing, so when I was first looking at a career in science and as I was sort of first beginning, like applying to programs and then my first program away from my home institution and then grad school visits, it was all very overwhelming because I realized uh, I was a very, very small fish in a very, very large pond. 
And um, I guess I wish I had known at that point that science in a lot of ways is sort of a great equalizer in that we're all very, very small in a very, very large pond. And even the people that like seem to have everything together and know the right people and have all the ins and uh, have all the past uh, successes, you know, you start day one on a project and uh, it's, uh, it's the same for everyone. So um, that I find very reassuring that we're all sort of in the same boat as we begin this career, this, uh, this great journey of science, if you will, um, because it becomes a lot less daunting when you know that it's uh, in a lot of ways sort of the same for everyone on day one. You might think you know a lot of things and you don't actually, and you might think you know nothing and it turns out you actually do, so. Yeah, everyone has to start somewhere. All right, and Jay Lisa, can you wrap us up? Um, the question was, <laughs> well, I guess, what's something that you wished you knew when you started research? And as you look back at your experiences, is there anything that happened that you didn't expect or anything throughout your experiences that was? Yeah, I feel like, like most of the panelists, I didn't know much about research at all because I come from a very small university in Puerto Rico with very little funding for research. Um, so to me, coming here during summers and even now as a graduate school was like a whole new world. One thing that I hoped I knew when I, when I got here was that I didn't have to do this alone. So I got here with the mentality that I needed to know everything that is there to know um, about everything chemistry. And that is not entirely true. And um, you don't need to know everything, um, especially about your particular thesis project for your summer project. Um, and there's always gonna be people there available to help you. Like asking questions is actually the most important thing in graduate school. When you have a doubt, don't, don't think that you need to answer it on your own because um, there are people surrounding you that might know the answer and might save you days or hours for, of you looking into the literature. And something that kind of surprised me also goes along the same lines that I didn't know anything about it is that um, I was able to learn that there are very different work environments um, and it, it varies depending on the lab that you are at. There are different mentoring styles, different types of colleagues, um, it, it, and just different ways to communicate with different people. Um, so that was surprising, but it's, it's also a good thing um, that there is diversity and a variety of people that you can interact with um, and that will help you along the way. So yeah, knowing that is important before you, got, before you get into grad school because you really need to make sure that you get into a lab that uh, goes well with your values and your work ethic and, um, and that you get um, the mentorship that you need as a graduate student. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think as you go forward in your scientific careers, continue to ask questions, continue to um, chat with different people. Everyone has a wealth of knowledge and there, there will always be different people that know more than what you think you know. Um, so in, enjoy the process. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us today and tune in again next week at 3 p.m. Eastern time for our discussion on how to apply for graduate schools. <laughs>